Okay, then let's start. Welcome to um, our introduction to research data management. We have two hours to introduce you to the main points of um, RDM. Um, next slide. And we aim with this lecture um, to give you an overview of the most important aspects of RDM. So it has really a character of a lecture. lecture. We have no interactive elements in this lecture. It's not like a training, but uh, you always invited to, to, to um, put questions in the chat and the ex one of our trainers will uh, give an answer to this. But at the end, we also have a question and answer uh, um, section. So if there are urgent questions, put it in the chat or leave it to the end. And at the end, we would like to ask you um, what topics you want to deepen in a further session. And this would be a really training session, for example, with exercises. So there the interactivity with the participants would be extended. Next slide. Yes, this is our outline for today. And we start with the welcome already running. <laughs> Next slide or two slides further. Um, yes, uh, who is Zepinit? We are the, um, yeah, we um, call for this session, for this lecture, and Zepinit is the Information Center for Life Science. Um, so we have a really broad understanding of life science and see medicine, health, and environment nutrition and agricultural aspects in this uh, topic. And basically we are a library, but we add other services and for, um, in the cu last couple of years also applied research to our spectrum. And what is most important, we foster open access and open data. Let's summarize this under the term open science. And in this direction goes our uh, research activities and our development of information infrastructure. And one part of this open science is research data management. Next slide. And here you see the four people uh, giving this lecture today. It's me, Birte Lindstedt, and three of my colleagues from the uh, Open Science Department. And you see, we all have different backgrounds and are experts on different aspects of um, research data management. And my colleagues will introduce themselves later. Next slide. So we coming from a very practical um, side because we are involved in the so-called national research data infrastructure. It's a national initiative. And um, there we built up consortia con uh, focusing on different disciplines. And of course we are involved in consortia uh, from the life science and one important um, consortia is NFDI for health. And there we develop infra information infrastructure for managing the data from personal health. For example, um, epidemiological studies or health studies. Um, and yes, there, this con uh, consortia is running till um, until no, 
uh, since, sorry, uh, two years. And the next uh, slide will show you our involvement in the consortium of microbiota research. This starts one year ago and um, two of my colleagues are involved in this consortium as a so-called data steward. Next slide. And there are more uh, life science related NFDI consortium and probably and hopefully we will be part of Fair Agro. This is uh, a consortium concerning the agro system domain. This will be decided this week. Um, so maybe we are lucky to have um, to be part of this consortium as well. Next slide. Yes, and we will start with the introduction of research data management with some fundamental concepts. And for the first one is, next slide, please. Um, what is research data? Next slide. A definition is basically not possible because it depends on the discipline. So basically any information that has been collected, observed, generated, or created to validate original research findings is research data. So it really depends on the discipline you work in. And sometimes it depends on the research funders. They define what is research data in a certain project. On the next slides, we will so, um, show you some examples coming from the life science sector. So generally speaking, it could be documents, it could be entries in a lab notebook, it could be a questionnaire, but also measurements or genetic sequences, um, also models or algorithms, software scripts. Um, so you see it's a wide range of possible research data. And next slide, if we dive into the documents um, in biomedicine, for example, for coming uh, with studies, health studies or clinical studies, we have a study protocol. Um, so, or a template of a questionnaire, a data management plan, all these documents belongs to the area of research data because they help to explain what research data underlies the research um, results. That's the main aspect here. So next slide. I hand over to my colleague Justine now for the topic of research data management. Thank you, Bertha. So what is research data management? It can be defined as a series of steps and methods that aim to make research data usable over the long term. And um, below are the steps that we usually follow at the DEMET. And you will see that in most institutions, uh, the steps are very similar. So you can start with planning your research project, then collecting data. And then, uh, of course, you can process and analyze your data. And then it's very good, as you will see, to publish and share your data. And then also to take care of preserving, preserving your data over the long term. And finally, um, it's also good to know where to search for data and how to reuse them. So this, um, these steps can also be represented in a cycle, as you can see here. You already saw this cycle earlier. And well, because it's a cycle, you can start 
anywhere, but we usually start at the planning phase, and this is what we will do today. And you can also see uh, in this cycle that above or next to the arrows, I have um, written some tools that we will also explore today, such as data management plans or DMP, electronic lab notebooks or ELNs, and so on and so forth. So uh, ZBMED or Publiso, one uh, service of ZBMED offers services along the research data lifecycle. For instance, to help researchers plan their research project, we have the Research Data Management Organizer, our DMO for life. We also offer services related to electronic lab notebooks, and we will discuss this later on. In terms of uh, data publishing and sharing, we have a digital object identifier service. We also have a repository for life sciences and a repository finder. And then we also have a digital archiving uh, team. And finally, we also have a portal, a search portal for life sciences called Invivo. So, um, why should you care about research data management? Well, there are interests for you, for instance, because it's good scientific practice. Also, it makes the, the transfer and management of knowledge easier. It also prevents uh, data loss, which is, in my opinion, the most uh, important for researchers. And if you do it properly, it will save yourself time in the future. But there are also external interests. So increasingly, research data management is uh, becoming mandatory from research funders, for instance, from the DFG, or also publishers have some requirements related to that, as well as sometimes your own institution. And uh, yes, as I said, uh, data loss can be a consequence of for research data management. And for instance, this paper, because of loss of raw data, but also because of inconsistent and non-reproducible values, uh, they had to retract their article. So there can be consequences if you do not take care of your data properly. And now we will talk about the FAIR data principles Yes, maybe you heard of this, FAIR data, next slide. And these are guidelines or principle um, swirling around the area all the time, FAIR data, what is it? Uh, FAIR stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Uh, it was created by some uh, researchers in 2016, and we now have a deeper look on these um, letters. Next slide. To be findable, data which is findable should have a persistent identifier. I guess everybody knows a digital object identifier. DOI or DOI, um, mostly text uh, publications uh, are referenced with this identifier, but it can, could also be um, meant to data publications. We will come to this later. Um, the findability relies also on rich metadata to describe the data set or whatever data you uh, want to uh, manage. And um, an important point is also that the data is registered or indexed in a searchable resource, for example, a data repository. We come to this later. Um, so next slide, accessibility. This goes with an 
using a standardized communication protocol. You all probably know HTTPS. And it's important that this protocol is open, free, and universally implementable. And um, also the metadata should stay accessible, even if the data should be lost or is not accessible directly. And we want to emphasize here that FAIR doesn't mean open data. So open data is data I can publish uh, without restrictions. But for example, data, it's not possible to uh, publish it because of the privacy issues. But also personal data can be fair. So, and this will be reached by the momentum that we provide metadata and tell the world this data exists, even if it's not directly accessible. This is really a, a important point here. Next slide. To be interoperable means um, the ability of a data set to work with other data sets or systems. So basically we speak about machine readability here, but also a really important point is that we use languages uh, for knowledge representations, for example, controlled vocabularies, ontologies, thesauries, for um, defining the metadata. So we can connect over using the way of the uh, standardized metadata that the data sets can speak with it, each other. Next slide. Reusability goes with uh, also again with metadata and um, especially metadata describing the context in in of the data. Uh, maybe or for example the provenance or the relation to other um, data sets, maybe it's part of, or it's a version of uh, another data set. But the reusability goes um, also with a data usage license. That's really important that as an author of a data publication, you tell other users what they can do with your data. And this implicates a license. We will come to this point also later. Next slide. And to give you an example of fair personal health data, we um, describe here a data set um, from GitHub. Next slide. And this fair data set um, made available on GitHub follows the FAIR data principle course. It's published with a DOI in the data repository Synodo, might be known to you. It is access, accessible because we can download the data from GitHub or Synodo. And the interoperability interoperability is um, proved because it JSON LD format, a machine readable format um, and a standardized format is used. And this data set is reusable because it has a creative common le uh, license called CC BY and CSA doesn't matter what it means at, at the moment. So fair data, this is a good example of fair data and um, the criteria it underlies. Next slide. 
So now I hand over to Alexandra, I guess. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Birte. And another fundamental concept which we can't skip uh, when we talk about research data management is uh, good scientific practice. And basically, research data management is an integral part of good scientific practice. But let's have a deeper look at this uh, topic. And uh, so basically, good scientific practice includes uh, principles, values, and standards of behavior and practice that must be achieved and maintained in the delivery of, in the delivery of work activities and in personal conduct. And uh, next slide, please. Um, in relation to research, uh, so the main aim is to secure research integrity, uh, but how can this be achieved? Uh, so in order to secure research integrity, we can or it is already done. Uh, so uh, the standards uh, are established and the researchers have to follow these uh, standards uh, on behavior. And uh, they are called codes of conduct. And in Germany, the, uh, an organization uh, which established uh, this policy is uh, DFG. Uh, and uh, it the code of conduct is called uh, guidelines for safeguarding good research practice and uh, with relation to the context uh, content. So it consists of the standards of good research practice, but very important, it also covers the topics of uh, or consequences of non-compliance with these rules. And uh, these uh, guidelines, they apply to every researcher in Germany, but of course there are also uh, other national standards or, of conduct. And uh, the one which might be applicable to you, it's also the European Code of Conduct uh, for Research Integrity. So please have a look after this lecture. And uh, on the next slide, we just wanted to uh, present you some examples of uh, good scientific practice. And uh, so of course, along with the uh, base, basic principles uh, which uh, research should be uh, laid on, such as honesty, respect, accountability, there are lots of points which concern research data management. And uh, for instance, documenting data and results, um, digital preservation of raw data, and also uh, using appropriate methods uh, for data analysis, all these are also examples of good scientific practices. Uh, but um, um, on the next slide, we would also like to draw your attention to the same to the examples of scientific misconduct. Uh, so for instance, providing false information uh, such as fabrication or manipulation of raw data or infringement of intellectual property rights. Also, yeah, which might include manipulating authorship or plagiarism or self-plagiarism. Uh, these activities should be avoided and all these practices are outlined in the codes of conduct. Uh, so please uh, have a look and uh, remember when you conduct your own research uh, to follow this conduct of conducts and we will have a further look uh, yeah, during today's lecture at the aspects concerning research data management. And next slide, please. Uh, the last topic, the last fundamental topic which, which we would like to cover today in the lecture are policies and guidelines. And this code of conduct on safeguarding uh, research data integrity, it's also one example of the guidelines. And uh, on the next slide, uh, we have provided some uh, definitions of policies and the guidelines. The terms are basically used interchangeably, uh, but the idea is that they describe um, some actions or rules or instructions uh, which can help you in uh, yeah, achieving your goals or in making decisions. And there are plenty of uh, policies and guidelines also um, with relation to the research data management. And on the next slide, um, so we would like first to classify them. So um, the DFG's guidelines, they are very general in their nature and they basically apply to every discipline and also to every researcher, meaning that every institution and every research group, uh, they have, they should follow uh, these principles, uh, but um, within each discipline and also within institution or even within research groups, uh, they can be uh, their own policies and guidelines. Um, uh, so uh, consider checking 
if your institution uh, has an institutional guidelines uh, yeah, with regard to handling of research data, uh, because TFG um, yeah, has requested that uh, everyone implements uh, their own policies and guidelines in order to support researchers in implementing best research data management practices. And next slide, please. Uh, so, um, as already said, uh, so research data management is an integral part of um, the guide of the safeguarding good research practice. And uh, here we have outlined uh, some of the guidelines uh, from this code of conduct, uh, which refer, uh, which are relevant for research data management and to name a few. Uh, so data documentation, uh, quality assurance, um, also establishing public access. So all this is um, part of the good scientific practice and uh, they are outlined and described uh, with concrete steps uh, in these DFG guidelines. Uh, and this is an example of general guidelines, but of course there are also discipline specific guidelines. And next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, but before we come to this uh, discipline specific, so I would like also to draw your attention that DFG also uh, provide a checklist for appropriate handling of research data. And they have even specified it with yeah, some more details. Uh, so please have a look. Uh, so especially when you would like to <clears throat> uh, apply for, uh, yeah, for a funding from DFG. Uh, and uh, finally, yeah, on the next slide, uh, here are the discipline specific policies and guidelines. Uh, they all um, yeah, uh, include aspects of research data management and um, so for the life science is a general, I would recommend uh, so to have a look at the toolkit for life sciences uh, from Elixir, which is an European initiative and they provide uh, yeah, lots of tools and also guidelines for every uh, subject uh, within life sciences. Uh, but we have here listed so also some examples of, of guidelines for health sciences and microbiology. So as you can see, there are also codes of conduct uh, within clinical research uh, called clinical uh, good clinical practice and also uh, German Society of Epidemiology, Epidemiology. They have also published their own guidelines and uh, yeah, different initiatives like NFTI for Health. They also uh, assist researchers uh, with uh, different policies, which then uh, should be helpful when if you uh, try to establish research data management in your project. And next slide, please. So now we are uh, already have covered some fundamental concepts and can already start with the first step uh, in the research data management. And I hand over to my colleagues. Thank you, Alexandra. So um, as Alexandra said, I will now start with the research data life cycle. And um, as I said, the, usually we start with uh, planning a research project. And one way of doing so is to write a data management plan, which, is, which can be defined as a formal and living document to describe the data, their generation and processing during the project, as well as how the data and research results will be archived afterwards to remain available, usable, and comprehensible. And in this definition, I think it's important to notice the living document. So um, it's of course very good to write a data management plan when you write a proposal, but it's also good to come back to it every now and then to see if uh, you are following the plan and if not, what can be adapted. And on the right hand side, you can see a screenshot of a data management plan template from the European Commission. So what does a DMP, DMP contain? So first there are the responsibilities and obligations. So this is very important to know who does what and who is responsible of what. Then you also have usually a description of the research project and the costs and resources that will be needed. Then you have a description of the research data. 
which can include the data types, the data quality, the data organization, and also the data usage. Then you also have information about metadata and referenceability. You also have information on how the data will be published, how they will be made accessible and reusable, how the data will be cited, and then you can have information about storage, or you should have information about storage and security. Also information about the about digital preservation. Then if needed, uh, there can be information about legal aspects and anonymization, and also how the data should be deleted if needed. So here are some example, discipline specific example of data management plans. Um, so depending on your field of research, I suggest you to have a look at these uh, discipline specific data management plan templates. We have here some examples in the health sciences and also in biological and environmental research. So why are DMPs important? Why should you care? Well, first, because it gives the project team an overview about the data, their storage and usage. And so it eases the coordination and common handling of research data. Then also it supports research integrity. So it's part of the good scientific practice. Again, it prevents data loss and security holes. It also facilitates the reuse of data. And um, again, it saves yourself time in the future. And something that might be appealing is that it increases your data citation. And last but not least, it sometimes can be a requirement from funding organizations. So um, there are many tools that you can use to create a data management plan. And one such tool is uh, the Research Data Management Organizer for Life or RDMO for Life. And it's a dedicated version of RDMO for all research institutions that work in the field of life sciences. And with RDMO for Life, you have the possibility of customizing questionnaire to subject specific needs. So this is, um, a version that we offer at the DEMET, and if you would be interested in using it, you can contact us. So we, you have our email address here, but you will have our contact details at the end as well. So now we continue the research data lifecycle with data collection, and um, my colleague Birte will talk about electronic lab notebooks. Yes, thanks. So, because lab notebooks are an important part of the data collection uh, step in the life science, we deal a lot with ELN, um, but we don't provide or we don't host an ELN, electronic lab notebook, um, but we give a lot of yeah, advice, um, training, or uh, support uh, by choosing the right tool. Because that's not really easy. What is an ELN? Basically, it's software. And um, it's a replacement of the paper one, of the paper lab notebook, notebook um, in the context of digital transformation. But it's not simply a replacement, but if you dive in the digital world, you have other possibilities of connecting this software to other tools. But also the basic uh, features are the same. You have a, a protocol or you put down your protocols of the experiment uh, in this uh, lab notebook. Um, but features in the digital world 
could you go to the yes thank you um uh, are widened by the uh, digital um, version of the lab notebook you have collaborational tools included you have electronic signatures there instead of the uh, paper one and um, you have the possibility to manage the whole lab inventory by this digital tool. So it's different from the paper version. Next slide. And coming back to the aspect of good scientific practice, also an ELN can um, contribute to this to the fulfillment of the good scientific practice. And here we have an example where the introduction of an ELN in a Leibniz Institute was mandatory because they were accused of um, misleading the good scientific practice principles because data was not transparent and data was lost. And in the, um, in the lab or the paper version of the lab notebooks, they can't um, yeah, provide the audit trail, the trail or the um, ongoing of a, the experiment they conducted. And so they were accused or the director was accused of misleading these principles. And as a consequence, they introduced an ELN mandatory, what is unusual that it is mandatory for all researchers in an institute. And yeah, they introduced a tool called RSpace. It's a, um, commercial tool and they provide training for all scientific personnel um, and all technical assistance in the in the labs. And yes, they made it mandatory, as I said. Um, and we want to point out here that an ELN has a lot to do with good scientific practice. Next slide. And now Hopefully, a video <laughs> will play um, that gives you some insights in, in the ELN context. ELNs oder auch Electronic Laboratory Notebooks sind die digitale Version des physischen Laborbuchs. Laborbücher werden genutzt, um den Forschungsprozess und die dabei entstehenden Forschungsdaten aufzuzeichnen. Das elektronische Laborbuch hat einige Vorteile, die das physische Laborbuch nicht aufweisen kann. Einer dieser Vorteile ist das kollaborative Arbeiten mit dem Laborbuch. Die meisten ELNs bieten den Forschungsteams mit verschiedenen Funktionen die Möglichkeit zum Austausch über das Projekt. Auch können die nutzenden Daten, die sowieso schon in digitaler Form vorliegen, direkt in das ELN hochladen. So gehören handschriftliche Verweise und Fahrtangaben der Vergangenheit an. Ein entscheidendes Argument für den Wechsel zu einem ELN ist die Nachnutzung der Forschungsdaten, die dieses ermöglicht. Dank des digitalen Formats ist es um einiges einfacher, Forschungsdaten zu archivieren und auch nach Abschluss des jeweiligen Prozesses für andere Forschende nutzbar zu machen. Bei der Erfassung der Forschungsdaten sind insbesondere die Metadaten hervorzuheben, da diese in elektronischen Laborbüchern deutlich leichter fällt. Weitere grundlegende Informationen finden Sie im ELN-Wegweiser von ZB Med, den wir für Sie in der Videobeschreibung verlinkt haben. Okay, thank you very much for playing this video. Um, hopefully this gave you some insights into what is an ELN and why using it. Next slide. Um, Yeah, what types of ELNs are there? So researchers or in the lab started using basic systems, basically uh, text software like Evernote. And um, they can 
make text entries and document their protocols of the experiments. They can have attachments and annotations and they can search in this um, basic systems. But over the time, there was a development to more specialized systems and they really called electronic lab notebook uh, software. And they have, sub, for example, subject specific functions. They provide templates for protocol, for example. They have possibilities of freehand drawing or table drawing. And they provide an API um, and, for example, an audit trail. And the more uh, high-end systems uh, in the next steps, they also include laboratory information and they are, for example, the inventory management. Um, so uh, they are really advanced systems and very complex systems um, for managing the whole um, lab. And this is the main difference to the basically ELN systems like lab folder or R space or ELAP um, FTW. Maybe you have heard these uh, names. And an example for such a high end system is LIMSOFI. It's really a laboratory information management system. Next slide. And what are the advantages or disadvantages of these different systems? Um, yes, the basic systems, they are very cost effective and they are easily used by the researchers. You don't have to learn a lot um, because you are used to these software tools, text software, basically. But as you can imagine, there are no really efficient features uh, for the basic electronic lab notebook. So, and these features you can find in these specialized systems like lab folder. And um, yes, they are, they come with API, APIs so you can integrate them into your own um, IT system um, in the RDM workflow you hopefully uh, have built up. And um, yeah, it, it's possible to install them locally. This is really a big point for the IT center that the local installation is possible and the data can be stored locally. And the high-end systems, yes, as I said, they come with all the management features for the lab, but they are very complex and they are of ba often based in the cloud solution. And with that, you risk the or you, you um, the dependence of the provider for these limbs. Um, is even higher than in these normal ELN tools. Next slide. And we want to emphasize three aspects here uh, concerning ELNs. And the first is that ELN goes with fulfilling the principles of good scientific practices, as I showed uh, from the example of the Leibniz Institute. You have an order trail, you can follow all the steps somebody has taken um, in an experimental uh, view. You have a version control. The deletion of data is impossible if you um, choose this option. You can search for entries, imagine a pile of paper lab books and you you search for a certain entry in this. We visited a lab in Cologne 
and we saw really piles of lab notebooks in the um, shelves and we wondered how could somebody find an entry in this so and this is this was really impressive and um yes this is much more e easier in a digital um, way yes you can freeze statuses and mark, for example, also entries. Next slide. So an ELN helps you to provide or to make data fair. We already presented the fair data principles and I don't want to go through all these points here, but yes, going with um, the good scientific uh, principle, also goes fair with ELN. Next slide. And the last point we want to emphasize is that the ELN is not a single solution you have to use in, in a lab. You have to integrate this tool into the whole pipeline of research data management in a networked research environment. So there is a data store and from there you get the data for the ELN for your experiments. And you also have the possibility to uh, connect an ELN with the repository to store and publish data and metadata. Remember the FAIR principles. And you have the possibility to connect an archive in the sense of long-term archiving to the ELN. So these are the main aspects uh, concerning ELNs. Next slide. And we go on in the next step in the research data lifecycle with data processing and analyzing. Thank you, Bertha. So uh, in this section, we will mainly talk about uh, data organization and documentation. We will not have enough time to talk about uh, reproducibility and that kind of things that could be for a um, more specialized training workshop. So in terms of data organization, there are some fond foundational practices. First, um, it is, of course, very important to document your data, but also how you collected them and how you processed them. Then um, it's also very important to organize your files, name them consistently and version them. So versioning is means uh, tracking the changes consistently. And then, of course, it's also important to back up your data. And I would say that in terms for the two or even for these three points in general, it's um, even better if there is an agreement within your research group or institution, and if then everybody does the same. So in terms of file organization and folder structure, it's important to invest time to plan, uh, to plan out a folder hierarchy. Again, it's good if uh, everybody in the research group does the same. Then it's also um, a good thing to think about, choose and record a naming convention for your files and folders and subfolders. And again, to version the files. So to do so, you can either append a version number such as for instance v1.0 and then v1.1 and so on and so forth or if you have um, a lot of files or maybe it's even better to use a version control system such as git um, on this slide you can find links to examples of folder structure of file and folder naming convention and of file name. So if you don't have anything like that um, decided 
within your research group yet, I would suggest you to have a look at these and then maybe you can, um, yeah, you can decide something either for yourself or also for your colleagues, if you can agree on a way of organizing your data. There are also tools for simultaneous renaming of files. So if you are working on a lot of files uh, and that you want to rename them in a way that is that gives some information, for instance, to append a version number or to append a date, um, you can do that with these tools so that you don't have to do it manually. And finally, um, a few words about versioning your file. So again, versioning is uh, tracking the changes you make to your file. Well, first, it's uh, important to define responsibilities for completion of files. So who is responsible uh, for, for completing which files? Then um, it's, of course, better to use sequential numbering, such as one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. And also to include a date and again, a version number in the name. Um, and for the date, it's also important to agree on the date format uh, with your colleagues. And then you can use a version control table or again, for large amount of data, a version control system such as Git. And finally, um, it's also a good thing to save milestone versions and store obsolete versions separately after backup. And now uh, Alexandra will talk a little bit about data documentation. Yes, thank you, Justine. And yeah, as we have just heard, data documentation belongs to data organization. And uh, even earlier, we have heard that data documentation is an integral of a very essential part of good scientific practice. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so why uh, we should bother about data documentation? So uh, first of all, uh, yeah, for new data users, but also for your future self, uh, who would need to find, understand, to reproduce and reuse your data. Uh, so independently of you, basically. Uh, so the data documentation is an investment in the future. Uh, and if we want to support data reusability also for our own uh, yeah, future projects, uh, we should invest time uh, in this yeah, a very time consuming process. Uh, so, uh, and on one side, so for data reusability, so data documenta documentation uh, plays a role, but also if you want to publish your data, uh, so you will be asked uh, to provide some uh, yeah, information uh, about your projects or your data set, and this you could uh, found if you're in your data documentation and save your time uh, once you publish your data in a, for example, data repository. Uh, uh, when we talk about data documentation, it's also important to distinguish two levels of documentation. Uh, so um, your projects or your data can be documented at the study level uh, and uh, your data sets, uh, they can be also documented individually. Uh, so study level descriptions, um, they support and provide the context uh, where and how and when uh, the data were collected, uh, while uh, data level documentation, it provides uh, details about the data sets itself. And on the next slide, please, um, we have listed some tools uh, which can be used for documentation, but actually they can also be used for data uh, collection. And the one is, of course, electronic lab notebooks, uh, but um, in the field of medicine, uh, it can be useful uh, to use an electronic data capture systems uh, like uh, REDCap, for example, um, also laboratory information management system, but of course, uh, the platforms for collaborative research and file sharing services such as Open Scientific Cloud uh, OSF, uh, they also can be used if you would like uh, to start with data documentation and uh, the resulting uh, outcome. So where, uh, how can your data 
documentation look like. Uh, so uh, it can be written in the form of a readme file. So uh, also da uh, data dictionary, code book, or data list. And for some further examples and more details <clears throat> on data documentation, I would like to suggest you to have a look at the Elixir at the M kit. Uh, so they provide really very useful information. Uh, but uh, so let's talk a little bit more about data documentation forms. And on the next slide, uh, so we can't skip the topic of metadata because metadata are actually highly structured data documentation. And if you uh, describe your data, you usually your use metadata. So one definition of the metadata is uh, data about data, uh, very simplified, but I think everyone can understand it. And metadata are basically standardized and highly structured information, uh, which uh, describe, uh, explain, locate, make it easier to retrieve, use, manage, and information resource. Uh, so with the help of metadata, you can describe and uh, uh, contribute to reusability of resources, so of your data sets and, um, and uh, Another uh, important point is that uh, the metadata, they uh, can be both human and machine readable. Uh, so they can be understood by persons, but also machine uh, machines. Uh, so they can uh, work with these uh, types of information, uh, which also uh, contributes to the data reusability. Uh, to name a few examples of metadata, so such information like uh, name, title, topic, or description of uh, your uh, study or of your data set. All of these are examples of the metadata. And on the next slide, please. Uh, so there are, of course, different types of metadata. And uh, one more aspect is that there are also metadata standards. And um, so the metadata standards are recommended to use. Uh, so they are basically uh, a set of metadata uh, which can be used uh, depending on the purpose of the description. And uh, so uh, the metadata and metadata standards, they can be classified in different ways. And for example, descriptive metadata, they can be opposed to technical metadata. And as I already said, uh, so you can describe the data on a project level, uh, but you can also provide the metadata about your data, concrete data sets. And of course, uh, there are general or domain agnostic standards, metadata standards, and discipline specific standards, which cover details of your specific research uh, field. And on the next slide um, is one example of a general metadata standard, uh, which can be applied to every uh, discipline or every domain. And it is widely used by the journals, uh, but also by the repositories uh, where you can uh, store your data. And uh, they are suitable uh, to provide description about the projects, uh, but they can also be used to describe your data. And it consists of, of only 15 metadata elements, uh, which are listed in the table on the right side of the slide. And uh, they are really basic and uh, understandable from the first sight. And um, yeah, so the title of a data set or a title of a uh, study. Uh, so it is one example of this uh, metadata field, uh, which is asked for, uh, or which you can document um, yeah, uh, with the help of the metadata, where if you decide to use this um, domain agnostic uh, metadata standard. And another point that uh, the general metadata standards say uh, uh, can be a basis uh, for description of your studies and data set, and they can be extended by adding uh, some discipline specific metadata standards and metadata. And on the next slide, um, it has rather a demonstrative purpose. Uh, so we have uh, listed only a few uh, metadata standards uh, applicable to health sciences and depending on uh, some purposes. So if you would like to report uh, your clinical data, it's worth uh, having a look at the SNOMED CT standard. Uh, so if you want um, 
uh, to index uh, your journal articles and you will probably uh, have to go to the mesh to the standard called mesh and so there is there are plenty of metadata standards and uh, these are only a few examples uh, so you might ask yourself uh, how can i choose an appropriate uh, or suitable metadata standard and next slide please here uh, it would be very helpful uh, to start uh, a search yeah for a specific metadata standards and it can be helpful uh, to have a look at uh, uh, some specialized um, search platforms uh, which are listed on this slide and also also these pl platforms they can be discipline agnostic uh, and but also discipline specific and uh, to name one example so the fair sharing collection uh, so you can search there for the standards and uh, use different filters to refine your results your search uh, so, and uh, you can set um, as a subject life science or agriculture or uh, uh, biomedical research and then uh, to restrict your search to the country, Germany, and you will uh, be displayed to uh, the standards applicable for your study. Uh, another possibility which might be helpful uh, if you think of introducing metadata standards in your research is uh, to check the submission and publication requirements of repositories where you would like to or share your data in the future and uh, they often provide um, uh, some guidelines or they have a publication policy like for instance uh, a service of nfdi for health uh, so they uh, describe their own metadata schema and there they link also to the used metadata standards uh, so, um, please have a look at the metadata standards uh, applicable in your research. Uh, do not think of introducing your own metadata standards, uh, but rather use already existing metadata standards like lots of, and they cover most of the purposes you might need uh, the metadata for. And uh, so, just uh, try uh, to introduce a metadata standard to describe your studies and your data sets so i think we can start again and as alexander said we will continue with the life cycle and the next step is data sharing and publishing and first um, i would like to talk a bit about data sharing so sharing your research data during the research project so what kind of research data can be shared. You can share your primary of or raw data, so the data collected from the main sources. You can um, also share micro data, so data on the characteristics of units of a population, for instance, age, home address, or that kind of things. You can also share aggregate data, so data combined from several measurements. For instance, you could have data for people from 20 to 25, then 25 to 30, and so on and so forth. And then you can also share metadata. So as Alexandra said, uh, data about data. You have different kind of metadata, for instance, semantic metadata, which describe the meaning of data, or you also have metadata about collections, such as in We3 data, which will be presented later on. So here I have listed um, general purpose collaboration tools. And um, I would suggest you to have a look at these. I will present two of them. Um, and then, yes, I will present B2Drop and also OSF. And if you are interested in the other ones, SciFlow is uh, I would say meant mainly to collaborate on scientific text. And then uh, the Git-based tools, they were not really meant to share data, but rather to collaborate on, um, on files, including, of course, uh, scripts and codes. So the two tools that 
I would like to present our the Open Science Framework or OSF, which is a free open source web application that connects and supports the research workflow, enabling scientists to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of their research and features of OSF in terms of sharing data include managing collaborations also across different institutions. And you can with OSF also share research projects and of course data. And then there is also B2Drop, which is a secure and trusted data exchange service for researchers and scientists to keep their research data synchronized and up to date and to exchange them with other researchers. Again, in terms of data sharing, features of B2Drop include easy collaboration with researchers from other institutions, of course, sharing research data and accessing shared artifacts. In terms of data sharing, um, I could not find any important difference between these two tools. Then um, there are also discipline specific collaboration tool. For instance, there is Ferdom Seek, which is a web based resource for organizing, sharing, and publishing heterogeneous scientific research data sets, but also models or simulations, protocols, workflows, samples, publications, and other research outcomes. And within Further seek, uh, they have some hubs, which are actually project hubs where investigators can store, share, access, connect, and interact with digital objects generated from their research and use them in their own analysis. There are three types of hubs, for instance, public hubs, but also project hubs uh, such as the NFDI for Health Study Hub COVID-19, which will be presented later on, and then there are specialized hubs. So the benefits of sharing your research data is that it makes your research transparent and thus increases trust in science. Also, if you share your data, it's easier than to claim your idea because you provide data to support it and then you can also get feedback. By sharing your data, you also increase the speed of discovery and the knowledge creation process. And finally, um, sharing your data enables to internationalize your research and be inclusive. So we will now continue with data referencing and I think Birte will now take over. Yes, thank you. So, Data referencing has a lot to do with persistent identifier. Next slide. And um, yeah, what is it? PID, it's a globally unique, actionable, and machine resolvable strings that act as a long lasting reference to a digital object. And this digital object can be, for example, a data set. It also can be a text, it can be a video, it could be an audio um, record, all the kind of digital objects we can share and share is not necessarily published openly. Um, so these PIDs play a really important role in research data management because they reference a di digital object. And there is a really informative uh, video here linked in the slides. So have a look later if you find time. Next slide. What examples of persistent identifiers exist? You all know the digital object identifier. Um, and it's provided 
by a um, uh, registration agency. Maybe you know um, data site. It's for scientific purposes. Um, and data site is specialized for registered DOIs for um, research data. And we are member there as SEPIMIT. But there are also um, PIDs for persons. I hope many of you have an ORCID. And this refers to the right person you are or you look for. But there are also PIDs for more specialized digital objects like a um, data management plan. And this comes always with a certain set of metadata to describe the object. Or for example, physical objects can also be get an, a PID. Next slide. And here we have a, an example why we need PIDs. So let's say you look for Thomas Müller, but not the soccer star, but um, scientists. And who is the really right Thomas Müller you look for? And um, if Thomas Müller you um, look for has an orchid, and persistent pers person-related identifier, and you use this identifier, this string, you will get to the right person. Next slide. And here is an example how a PID looks like. It always has a prefix, and in this example of a digital object identifier, this prefix refers to the repository for life science, our specific um, repository at set we meet. The suffix, this row of uh, letters and numbers, refers to the document. In this case, it is a text um, as a di digital object. So this is an example of the syntax of an um, uh, DOI, but this is applicable for the most of the PIDs. Next slide. As I said, we are a member of DataSite and we provide uh, DOI services for uh, the life science community, for institution who could be member of our DOI consortium and then um, we can provide DOIs for digital objects for you. Next slide. Yeah, from data sharing to data publishing. Next slide. What is the benefit of really publish your research data? not just sharing with a certain community, for example, your work, working group or your specific community of researchers. Here we speak about making data openly accessible. Um, the benefit is that you um, will save your data in the long term. Um, and make it reusable and citable. And data publication can be or is our uh, independent scientific results. Not just your uh, journal article is a scientific result. Also, uh, the data properly managed and made it fair. Um, and you will increase your visibility, transparency, and accountability as a researcher also through data publications, not only through journal articles or text publications. Next slide. But how to select the data to publish? 
some criteria are, for example, the requirements of funders of your research project. Or a good hint is um, if you have a journal article published, you should also publish the data underlying this scientific text publication. Another criteria could be the re reuse potential from your point of view, from the author's point of view. For example, because the quality is high, the historical importance is high, the uniqueness of the data, maybe the data you produced um, is non-repeatable. Um, the originality, the size, the scale, also the costs can be uh, a criteria for publishing or not. And as a last criterion, the existence of functional reusability, why we make data fair and make it reusable to um, save money, to put it quite simple, um, we don't have to produce this data again. And other researchers know about the data if you publish them, or at least the meta metadata. So the functional reusability uh, includes questions like, can data be read uh, or used? Are metadata available? Um, and so forth. Uh, and other questions concerning the reusability in a functional way. Next slide. What types of publication we find for research data? Um, it can be an independent information object, digital object. And it is normally published in the data repository like Synodo. Uh, I guess everybody knows Synodo. And the other possibility is the metadata set. Other possibilities are um, data supplements in an enhanced publication. So you have a journal uh, uh, article and um, the data is connected in the link uh, with the uh, providing of the metadata of this um, journal article. Another uh, form or way to publish data is a data paper uh, or data report. And this is a content of a so-called data journal. And these journals only provide descriptions of data sets. Um, and they get um, DOI, for example, as well as journal, journal articles. But you only find descriptions of data sets and the links to the data set itself. Next slide. But as I said, the data repository is the common way of publishing data. And this is the location where digital and also physical objects are stored and documented. So documented means described by metadata. And which enables the separate publication and archiving of these objects. And the data access is uh, different depending on the repository. Next slide. Why using data repositories for publication of research data? On one side, there is a backup, so it's safe. But the main points are that you increase the discoverability and accessibility. So the potential data reuse rise with publishing in a data repository. Why? While these 
um, because these data repositories are harvested by search engines. engines. For example, base data site search, but also Google data set search, or our, our own um, search portal for life science from set we meet, Livivo. And the data repositories usually helps you to make your data fair. For example, by mentioning a DUI to your data set. Next slide. What kind of data repositories are there? You probably have an institutional repository at your own institution. So only members of this institution are allowed to publish in these institutional repositories. Then there are generic or interdisciplinary repositories like Synodo, Dryad, Figshare, Radar, maybe you know one of these. And here we have all kinds of data going through all disciplines uh, and have no special or customized metadata for these publications, only like title, title, author, um, or this more generic metadata. And this is the advantage of a discipline-specific repository because it provides or it has possibilities to increase the findability of your publication, of your data, because it's customized to the needs of this data you want to publish. Next slide. How you choose a fitting repository. And as I said before, we recommend looking for a well-established repository in your discipline, a discipline-specific repository. The second choice would be your institutional repository, if you have one. Or for example, a repository recommended by your funding organization, by your funder. Or if this is not applicable, you can use Figshare or Synodo, which is at least open source, source um, Synodo. Um, and in the, in the sense of open science, we prefer open source tools and repositories. But if this have no results, there are also repository finders. And there was one man next Yes. Um, I could not hear you really well for the few last seconds, but no, it seems to be okay. fine. So please continue. Sorry to interrupt. So I. I said, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, and one registry of research data, very well curated, is V3 data. Here you find um, globally um, an overview of research data repositories from different disciplines. And they are listed and curated by uh, a lot of criteria you can choose from. For example, if there is an open access to the data or if the repository provides an PID service. Okay, next slide. We also from, yes, thanks. Um, from ZBMIT, we also have a curated list of repositories coming from RE3 data, but focused on the life science. 
And here you find um, also a curated selection of repositories and a description um, and you can find um, your respectable repository fitting your purposes. Next slide. And also Alexia, an European initiative for bioinformatics provided a, a list of databases coming from the biomolecular data uh, topic. So these are good examples for searching for fitting repository for your data publisher. And with this, next slide. We come to the next step, to digital preservation. And I hand over to Katarina. Yes, hello. Uh, so uh, I'm doing the digital preservation part. And uh, next slide, please. OK, so yeah, uh, and the next slide. So um, digital preservation is working with um, over the long term. So um, we are working with problems um, for data reusability um, beyond 10 years, for example. And I brought some examples of information loss. Um, one on the left is um, the recording of the original of the, yeah, the original moon landing. And the tapes were probably deleted as part of um, the usual workflow of just reusing the tapes and deleting the old content. Um, nobody knows really what happens to these tapes. So this is some kind of human error um, probably. And um, in the middle, there's one of my files, um, back when I did my research, the file is somehow corrupted. And on the right, the file is okay. The content is also okay, but you cannot read it because um, you do not have the viewer, the software anymore. Um, in this case, it's also a um, commercial file and a binary um, format. So um, you can open it in a reader, in a text editor, in this case, a hex editor, but you cannot read the contents. It just seems to be gibberish. So this is, these are just some selections of problems you can run into, um, but we try to take care of um, all kinds. So next slide. So yeah, um, our aim is keeping data reusable over the long term. And what does long-term mean? Well, as long as the data is deemed relevant, and this of course also depends on the data um, and on your work, your context, um, your research uh, community. It's, um, it's part of good scientific practice as um, recommended by DLG. It's um, also part of the FAIR principles. Um, reusability has, do not, does not have a, a time limit, and it can be also part of funder requirements. In particular, DFG recommends um, storage of data and um, keeping data accessible for um, about 10 years. Um, you can run into the problems I um, already mentioned already within 10 years and of course also beyond. So next slide. Um, we have a community, and today is a special day for um, the digital preservation community um, because it's World Digital Preservation Day. And if you want to see what uh, we are up to, you can um, check out the hashtag WDPD2022 on Twitter. So that's just a, a short note. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, what does digital preservation mean for you? Um, as Justine already mentioned during the part about DMPs, um, really define who is responsible for which data, which data step, also beyond the project. So there's no mistakenly deletion or loss of data at some point. And also um, try to use several copies of your data, um, possibly in, uh, in, on different media, um, in different locations. 
and if possible, um, also version your data. Because if there's some kind of data corruption going on, it's going to be transferred to every copy as well. And if you have an old version, you can go back to it and um, you have a version with the uncorrupted data. Next slide. Um, the other part that is also really important already doing research, um, try to use text-based and well-known formats. So um, in case uh, the software company goes corrupt, co not corrupt, uh, bankrupt, um, you do not have the um, software for using your, um, your data and your files anymore. Um, so you have the problem here um, that's also shown on the left, on the right, um, in this little picture. Um, if you instead use um, formats and widespread use, um, there's likely another tool you can use to open your files. Um, if you use formats um, that are used by open source software, someone else can also build a viewer. Um, because the specifications of the format are published. If you use text-based formats, you can also open them in a text editor and at least still read the text. Um, or can um, you know what um, kind of um, software has been used before and try to um, get a version of it? That was also a problem with uh, um, the um, software that um, they, they have been used with um, the old data I um, already showed you. It did not really know what kind of software was used um, back then for these old files. And um, try to use simple formats because um, CSV, for example, which is a simple format, you can um, open all kinds of different uh, software and viewers, for example, text editor, Excel, and so on, um, which is not possible for Excel SX. That is an Excel format. And that's it from me. And I hand over to the next one. Yeah, and now we are at the very last step of research data life cycle, and it deals with uh, data search and reuse. And here we would like to present you some services or some hints how you can uh, find the data which you can reuse in your own projects. And on the next, next slide, please. Um, Next slide. Uh, so we have listed, uh, listed a few of the strategies uh, which can be helpful for you to search for data. And uh, so you can use services uh, where the data can be published. Uh, so you search for the data there where it is already published. Uh, so, and these are the data or metadata repositories, uh, first of all, and to find the suitable repository uh, for your data and your research data field, you can use researchdata.org service. Uh, so lots of data are still uh, published um, as supplements uh, to the journal articles. Uh, so you might need, um, to go through the literature and journal articles uh, in order to find uh, suitable research data for you. And uh, also there are data journals, uh, so where you can find data reports. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so there are also some dedicated search engines already. And uh, to name uh, two interdisciplinary uh, research, so search engines for research data. Uh, these are the data site search and um, Google data set search. Uh, but there are already some discipline specific uh, search engines which might be more suitable uh, for your needs. And uh, the one is a Livivo, it's a web service. And uh, on the next slide, we would like to present you it in more details. Uh, so basically, it is a search portal um, for literature and research data in the field of life sciences, and it accesses uh, about more than uh, 50 sources of data and uh, inclusive meddling, and it covers the domains uh, yeah, not only of medicine, but also agricultural research, uh, bi bi biology, and uh, all other fields of the life sciences. And on the next slide uh, is um, a screenshot from this portal and 
like in any other search engine. Uh, so you would need, uh, in order to find the research data, you would first need to enter your search terms. Uh, then, because it's a portal uh, to search for different types of research data and inclusive also literature and research or scientific articles, uh, so you will have to uh, select uh, document type uh, which you are interested in. So in this case, uh, yeah, you can set, um, you can filter uh, by research data, and then you will be delivered some results. And uh, in the results bar, uh, you can click on uh, some buttons uh, in order to come to this uh, research data. Uh, so please have a look at the filter possibilities of this platform. So they are really adapted to the life sciences. Uh, another example uh, where you can find uh, the research data is presented on the next slide. And uh, it is relevant uh, mostly for the rich searchers who would like to reuse the data from clinical, epidemiological, and public health studies. And here, uh, the, study method, the studies are mostly published uh, together with the relating study documents. Uh, so the studies mean then uh, the study level descriptions of the data. And on the next slide, you can see the, uh, how these platforms look like. And what I would like to draw your attention to is uh, that there is a very helpful filter uh, where you can select whether the data, yeah. So this platform, it collects uh, the metadata about the plans to share the data. And as you might know, uh, so in clinical and epidemiological research, uh, they uh, do very often uh, deal with uh, data privacy, and that's why the data sharing is not always possible. Uh, so uh, there is a very convenient filter uh, to search for studies which managed uh, to share the, the data, also personal related data, and. Um, because probably your aim is to find this data and to start a collaboration. Uh, so these are just two examples and some more examples to search for data uh, have been listed on the slides before. Uh, but uh, on the next slide. Uh, so once you decide to reuse uh, the data or if you were inspired by a, uh, some specific data set or another kind of research data, so it might be tricky to cite the data uh, because they are published in such a different ways. And uh, here on this slide, we have collected some uh, helpful resources which you can have a look uh, at uh, once you have the slides, uh, which uh, provide you some um, advices on how you can cite the data. Uh, and set this uh, to in terms of research uh, data reuse and uh, search. Next slide, please. And um, so uh, the very last point, which we would like uh, to touch are the legal issues. Uh, so very briefly, because yeah, we can talk about it uh, for weeks, I suppose. And here we distinguish between privacy issues and intellectual property issues. And now I will introduce you uh, to the privacy issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the privacy issues, uh, yeah, uh, they come into question when uh, the researchers uh, would like to collect the data from individuals. And as we all know, uh, the data are private from individuals and so they have to be protected and this makes uh, the research yeah somewhat uh, challenging and also data reuse is um, yeah very can be very restricted uh, so but there are intentions and yeah lots of initiatives who would like um, to facilitate uh, data sharing and data publication also of this uh, pri um, yeah, personal related information. And uh, this is regulated by the general data protection regulation. Uh, so uh, this is a, um, uh, legislation uh, in European Union uh, on how to deal with data protection and data privacy. Uh, so, and here, um, they define uh, the main all the main access 
of aspects which had to be considered and they also provide some helpful definitions like of uh, personal data and which is any information in associated with an identified or identifiable natural person and uh, who is this identifiable natural person so it uh, can be direct so it's a person who can be directly or indirectly identified uh, with the help of any information so any identifier and um, the personal data they all um, enjoy uh, different levels of uh, data protection and uh, highly protected data are called uh, sensitive personal data and they are also subject to specific processing conditions and on the next slide uh, we have listed uh, these uh, types of sensitive personal data and uh, so these are the data uh, these are personal data revealing racial, ethnical, uh, political, re religious, and philosophical beliefs. Also, the membership to a trade union, uh, genetic data, biometric data, health-related data, and data concerning a uh, person's sex and sexual life. Uh, so, but uh, the term sensitive, so it can be used not only, so it can be applied not only to personal data, and there are some sensitive ecological data, for example, which also uh, should be protected in a, a very strict way. And um, on the next slide, uh, so the data, they are personal data, they are highly protected, yeah, um, but uh, how can we then share them? Uh, so the goal is, uh, if we would like to share the data, is uh, to remember that um, we have to protect sensitive information and safeguard the privacy of our uh, participants. And uh, currently there are two uh, main strategies uh, of data identification. Uh, so if we would like to share the data, we should guarantee that uh, our persons, our individuals and participants uh, they are not identifiable anymore. And here there, is, uh, there are two approaches. One is uh, data pseudonymization and another one is data anonymization. And data pseudonymization is basically a separation of uh, data uh, from, uh, yeah, separation of the data in two types of data sets. Uh, the one contains personal related data and another one uh, all the other data, uh, so uh, but you store both files, uh, but in different uh, in places separately. And uh, when we talk about data anonymization, so it uh, means that we process the data, personal data, uh, where um, um, uh, this personal related data are completely uh, or and irreversibly removed. Uh, but it's very um, challenging to achieve because uh, personal related data can be helpful uh, to conduct some analysis. Uh, so there are also different strategies uh, to data anonymization. And here we would like uh, to recommend you to have a look at some further uh, publications uh, in the topic. And on the next slide, we have uh, briefly compared uh, the data these two approaches of pseudonymization and anonymization. Uh, so basically, uh, if your data are pseudonymized, they still uh, uh, fall into under the scope of the uh, GDPR. Uh, so because they, um, you do not delete personal related data and uh, an advantage of data anonymization is that uh, so your data are anonymized and they can be uh, treated as they shouldn't uh, be treated as personal data anymore. And this means that they are easier to share. Next slide, please. Uh, so of course, there are lots of initiatives who would like to support uh, the data sharing also uh, of the personal related data. And there are already some uh, tools uh, which might be helpful, helpful for you to manage and analyze uh, these personal uh, data. Uh, so it all starts with consent form, uh, forms, and here it's useful to use a general 
of the common template. Uh, so uh, there are already some uh, templates which you can have a look at. Uh, once you get the slide, uh, then there are also some tools uh, which could help you to anonymize your data. Uh, there are intentions uh, to, um, yeah, to provide, uh, yeah, to analyze the data, uh, but to have control over the access to the data so that you know who uses it and can guarantee that the data is not misused. And a very, a rather new but very promising approach is uh, distributed analytics. Uh, here, uh, there are two approaches called data shield and personal health strain. And on the next slide, so just to give you an idea, uh, what does it mean? Uh, so uh, distributed data analysis uh, could be viewed as an alternative to data anonymization. And the idea is that the personal data remains in the original location. And the researchers who collected this data, who own this data, uh, they enable analytical tasks so the data can be analyzed, but in a secure uh, environment uh, without uh, really sharing uh, this data with uh, some uh, yeah, foreigners, so some third parties. Uh, so it's uh, a rather new approach. And if you would like uh, to have some uh, further details, so it's worth uh, to have a look at the linked uh, article yeah, on this slide. And uh, that was a very brief introduction to the uh, topic of data privacy. And now my colleague Justine will continue with another uh, legal aspect uh, yeah, important for research data management. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, so actually, I think I will just um, talk about the take home messages because um, we also have a short poll at the end of the lecture, during which we would like to ask you if you would be interested in further uh, training workshops. And um, I really want to give you some time to answer this poll. So I will skip the slides uh, about licenses, except the last one. But don't worry, as we said, we will share the slides with you. So you will have uh, some time afterwards to uh, look at the content if you are interested. So basically the take home message about um, licenses is that they facilitate the transfer of usage rights. So it's interesting for the data producer and the data uh, user. And also, of course, we recommend to use suitable licenses. For instance, do not use a software license for your research data. And uh, suitable licenses for data include the Creative Commons copyright licenses. For instance, this presentation um, will be shared with a CC BY license, which means that if you want to reuse the content, you have to cite um, at least ZPMED. And then another suitable license for data is or are the Open Data Commons licenses. And uh, you also have here on this slide a link to an overview of possible license. So with that, um, we end the, the topics of today's lecture.